One, two, three. One, two, one, two. One, two, three. Is the sound coming through there? Great. Special thank you to everybody for helping pack up. And a special warm welcome to our afternoon session to the faithful few who are here on time. And, um, you know, the Bible says, Jesus says, if you seek me with all your heart, you're going to find me. And so you're going to get the blessing. So um, we've been going through our series, What Jesus Says About, and I believe Chantel really preached it up this morning. And today's topic that we're about to look at is What Jesus Says About the Social Order and the State. Before we jump into that, I just want to draw your attention to what we have coming up through the week. Monday night at 7 o'clock right here, I'm going to be teaching on what Jesus says about work-life balance. What Jesus says about work-life balance. More than ever, people's lives are a bit crazy, aren't they? And so come and hear what the Bible has to say about that. Jesus has planned a way forward for us there. Then on Friday night, we'll hear William preaching again. By the way, William has got a gift for preaching and teaching. And for those of you who have heard William in the last couple of days, um, you'll know that I'm, I'm not exaggerating. William's a, he's easy to listen to, enjoyable teacher. So come along on Friday night to hear about what Jesus says about the end of life. And this is an important topic, obviously, and an interesting topic. And Jesus says a lot about it. And so let's find out what that is. Then next Saturday, what Jesus says about new beginnings. And that's our 1045 session. And unlike today, next Saturday, there'll only be one session of this series. And it's just in the regular 1045 time slot. And then that's it. And then we have Monday... Friday, Saturday, Monday, Friday, Saturday. So two more weeks after that. So we're um, kind of a quarter of the way into our series right now. Well, let's have a prayer and we'll ask God to bless us as we look at this important topic, what Jesus says about the social order and the state. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord God, for giving us the Bible, the answer book to life's most important questions. Thank you that you care about us, God, and that you've got a purpose and a plan for each one of our lives. Lord, we want to live the, a life of happiness and fulfillment, and thank you for giving us your teaching on these topics. So please bless us today. Keep your promise, and we claim it. James 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that's what we're doing here today. So thank you, Lord, and we ask for your blessing and presence in Jesus' name. Amen. What Jesus says about the social order and the state. You know, up on the screen, we've got a picture here of the... Well, you tell me what it is. Where's that? That's right. What's, what particular mountain are we looking at? <coughs> Mount Cook, of course. New Zealand is a beautiful country, isn't it? Who here is proud to live in this country? Yeah, we should be. Um, on all kinds of index and scales... New Zealand appears in the top 10, often the top four. Um, it's a, one of the greatest nations in the world. And in the Bible, we see that the Jewish people were very proud of their nation. And as we look at the scripture, the Bible has a lot to say about how we should respond to the nation that we live in. And it has a lot to say about another kingdom, a spiritual and eternal kingdom that we can belong to as well. And so there's really two parts to today's topic how we respond to our own nation and how we respond to the nation that we're all a part of spiritually. All right. So um, we're going to look at those questions today. So first of all, we're going to start with this. What did Jesus say about the laws of the nation or the kingdoms that we live in? Now, this is an interesting topic. Sometimes when you see those flashing lights behind you and you're driving along and you think, and you see that police car pulling you over for speeding or whatever, and you think, that's the devil, he's trying to get me today. Is it the devil who's trying to get you? <laughs> well, what does the Bible says? So um, what did Jesus say about the laws <clears throat> or, the, or the nations, of the nations or kingdoms that we live in? Let's have a look. Um, Mark chapter 12, verse 13 to 17 is what we're looking at today. So you can turn in your Bibles and have a look with me. Mark chapter 12. And it says, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. So these were political leaders and religious leaders, jealous of Jesus, trying to discredit him. And they came to him and they said, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. 
You're swayed by, you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God according to the truth. So here's a question. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, just to set the scene, Jesus was living in Jerusalem. He was a Jew, and that's a nation, at a time when the Roman nation were their dictators, as it were. And so they were overruled by the Roman Empire. So the little Jewish nation still existed and had plenty of Jewish characteristics, but they had this burden to bear that they were overruled by the Roman Empire. So it would be Roman soldiers that are marching through their streets or whatever, and they were the ultimate authority at the time. And so they asked Jesus a trick question. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Because um, it would have been popular Jewish response to say, forget about the Romans. Um, but if he declared that, then they could get him in trouble with the Romans. But if he said, let's just uh, follow the Romans, then they would say, well, what kind of a Jew are you? Where's your um, commitment to our own nation? So let's see how Jesus responded. They said, should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. This is a coin. And they brought him the coin and they asked him, whose image is this? He held it up. And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus said to them, well, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. He had a smart answer for everything, this Jesus. You just can't get past the guy. He's filled with the Holy Spirit that was giving him special wisdom. And so Jesus talked about the, he's recognizing an authority here, an earthly authority. And the Bible teaches that we should respect the nation's rules that we live within. And so when you see those flashing lights behind you for speeding, the Bible would say, well, we probably shouldn't have been speeding. We need to respect the laws of the nation that we live in. Even when the laws aren't fair, Jesus urged his followers to be model citizens. One of the Roman rules was that they could command someone, a Jewish person if they wanted to, a Roman soldier could say to a, a, just any civilian, you have to carry my gear for me for one mile. And so they had the right to do this. You just had to drop whatever you're doing and carry their stuff for them. And Jesus said, well, you've heard it, um, it said that you know, you have to carry somebody's stuff for them under force. But Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go with them for one mile, go with them two miles. What's he teaching? To be generous and to be a person who is a model citizen. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Because often we find ourselves thinking, boy, what's the limits of the law? And I want to I get away with what I can get away with. But he says you should be people of upstanding integrity when it comes to the nations that you live within. Jesus himself willingly submitted to earthly authorities. Remember, Jesus was dragged before, first of all, um, the religious leaders when they were wanting to crucify him, and then they knew they didn't have the authority to kill him, so they had to take him before the Roman governor, whose name was Pilate. And Jesus submitted to Pilate's authority, even though he is God. And Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world, and if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is of another place. And he didn't quarrel, and he didn't get into debate with um, the governor, Pilate. He respected his authority. And there's a lesson for us there. You know, in our way of life and thinking, we're often brought up in Australia and New Zealand to mock authority figures, aren't we? And this is the Australian way, and I've been in New Zealand for 10 years now, and it's the New Zealand way too. We make fun of our political leaders. We think it's great to tear them down. And um, that's just how we're sort of brought up. And we sort of had the, have this attitude, I'm not going to respect anyone unless they've earned my respect. Does that sort of sound about right? But Jesus says, oh, I've got another way for you. If somebody's in a position of authority, I want you to respect them whether they've earned it or not, whether they've deserved it or not, and in that way, you are living an honourable life. And even when the person is dealing a low blow, if you honour them, God says these beautiful words, it's as if you're honouring me. You don't need to do it unto them. You're treating them well, as, and in doing so, you're, you're giving me honour by your behaviour. So think of it as honouring me when you're good to those in authority who don't necessarily even deserve it. 
So Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. He's demonstrating that there's another kingdom there, but he's honouring the kingdom that he's living amongst right now. We're going to have a look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. So there's going to be three slides on the screen here, just getting you ready for a bit of text coming up. But have a look with me. Paul the Apostle writes, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority which God has except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's amazing, isn't it? Sometimes we think, oh, these our, our political leaders are real losers, or they're really doing the wrong thing. Do you think it was any different 2,000 years ago when Paul penned this? Were there... Were the political leaders much more godly at that time? Were they? No way. They were doing things like killing people and, um, you know, abusing other people and all kinds of crooked things. But Paul writes uh, these interesting words. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So, friends, if we buck up against the New Zealand government, we, it's like we're bucking up against God in some sense. Believe me, the New Zealand government is not God, but it's showing disrespect for authority that God has said you should show respect to them. And so verse 3 says, For rules hold, hold no terror for those who do what's right, but for those who do what's wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. Romans uh, 13 verse 4 says, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, ancients of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of as a matter of conscience. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, don't just do the right thing so you don't get in trouble and punished. He said, you should have a conscience about this as well. Romans, this is like unpopular stuff, let's be, let's be honest. We don't want to have to have a conscience about obeying our political leaders and all the rest of it, but God's saying, no, I want you to be above board. I want you to be upstanding citizens. And people say, what are you reading these verses out? Give us something that tells us we can do whatever we like. But, you know, no one in this world can do whatever they like. Even somebody who rebels against God and, and follows their own ways they're still limited by reality. They can't do whatever they like. And so whichever way we go in life, we're going to face consequences for our actions. And Jesus is opening up a path that's going to result in the most blessing and happiness and peace in our lives. And um, verses 6 and 7 says, This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Now you're thinking, what? We have to pay taxes? I just thought we had to do that so we don't get in big trouble. But God's saying, no. This is all good. I'm going to use that system. As imperfect as it may be, I'm going to use it, and you should honour it. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe someone taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then give revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Now, remember how I said a few moments ago that we generally only honour somebody if we think we've earned it? Who's having that turned on their head right now? I know that this was something that I only really got a grasp of even in my late 20s or early 30s, that we should honour people whether they deserve it or not. And so God's teaching us to honour those in authority, to honour our peers, and to honour those under our care. We should treat everybody with honour. And when you put it that way, of course it makes sense. Um, but so often we fall into the cultural pattern of only honouring people who we think really deserve it or whatever. We're much happier honour the underdog than someone in authority in our culture. But Jesus is saying, no, honour the underdog, sure, but honour the whole lot. All right. Peter says the same thing in, in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. And he says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. This means, students, you've got to be respectful to your teachers. What a pain. The Bible's telling us some tough stuff today, isn't it? And um, work, workers, we've got to show respect to our bosses. What if your boss is a real jerk or a real donkey? Do you have to be respectful to them according to this? I'm afraid so. Is it saying that we approve of their behaviour? No. But we can still treat them with honour even though they may not deserve it. It's an amazing thing when you do that, by the way. Um, some people don't know how to handle it. 
and your honoring them can be a catalyst to them rise, improving their behavior. But some of us, we will honor someone who's going to maintain their pig-headedness, and God, I believe, will ultimately vindicate us in those tough situations. And I've seen it again and again, um, where something unusual happens that will eventually remove the person from their position. But that's not to say that, it's, that it'll be, happen in a real hurry. Sometimes we have to endure for a long time before that happens. And God, I believe, will give us strength to get through those situations when we are sort of trapped in that environment and can't get another job or whatever else. We to honour those in authority. How do I know that Peter is talking about even um, unreasonable people? Well, at the time that Peter is saying here in this scripture, you can see there in verse 17, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God and honour the emperor. Well, at this time, the emperor was this guy named Herod, and Herod was trying to kill Peter. Did you catch that? Herod was trying to kill Peter, and at a time like that, Peter writes this letter, you need to honour the emperor. Wow, what a different attitude. Sounds a little bit like what Jesus was saying when he said, love your enemies, doesn't it? Do, pray for those who persecute you and show them honour. It's a completely different path to what the world and our culture would teach us. Our gut instinct would take us another way, but the Holy Spirit would take us on a higher path. All right, so we're to honour the things that God has set up here on earth. Now, what does Jesus say about instances where the laws of the land are in direct conflict with God's laws? Because that's bound to happen from time to time, isn't it? It's even prophesied in, Re in Revelation that in the last days that one of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath commandment, will be singled out politically and those who keep the Sabbath will have penalties placed against them. It's already happening in various places around the world. So what does Jesus say about these instances? In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it makes it really clear. If it's a direct contrast with what God would have you do, God will have you disobey the law in that situation. Now, some of us will look for an excuse and say, oh, it's a si there's situations like this all the time. Your conscience needs to be um, clear on that. But Peter says to the other apostles here, he says, we must obey God rather than human beings. So if there's a situation where... Um, you know, you're in Nazi Germany and you're a German and you're told to kill a Jewish person and you know it's just wrong. Do you do it or not? No, you don't do that. Can you get yourself in hot water? I'm sure you will. And so what about in China, even in the last decades? If you want to teach and preach the Bible, you're going to get thrown in prison. So do you stop teaching and preaching the Bible? No, you've got a difficult path to tread, don't you? And the Bible... Um, says that there are going to be times when God's people are persecuted and life's going to be tough because you're going to obey God even when it means um, serious consequences. So these are some interesting dynamics and we just can be thankful that at present in New Zealand we don't have to worry about those kind of things. All right. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul then moves into another phase in his writings and he establishes that Christians are citizens of a nation here on earth but we're also citizens of a heavenly kingdom that is on earth already, but extends beyond this world. Philippians 3.20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does it say our citizenship is? In heaven. Now, I think it's pretty cool if you've got a dual citizenship. I've always thought, admired people. They've got like New Zealand and an American citizenship or a New Zealand and an Australian one. Some people say, why would you have New Zealand and Australian of all places? But anyway, I think it's kind of cool. Well, guess what? If you're a believer, you've got a dual citizenship. Whatever nation you belong to plus a heavenly one. Now, that passport, friends, is a cool passport to have. Some passports are better than others, but nothing will beat the heavenly passport. And it can get you somewhere that no other passport or visa is able to get you. And we're going to talk at the end about how to get this heavenly passport. And so um, we're going to see that there's these two kingdoms in place. God's kingdom, uh, in fact, God's kingdom, as we look at them in contrast, uh, in, when you become a member of that kingdom, the whole dynamics there override 
the kingdom that we're in here. In God's kingdom, our national identity becomes less important than our spiritual identity. And so this is how come you guys can put up with me here in New Zealand, I believe. Kind of. Um, that when we, when we all love Jesus, we put aside our differences. And you know, on those days when the Australians beat the Kiwis in the rugby, and they do happen sometimes, don't they? You can still love me, praise the Lord, because we're citizens of the same spiritual kingdom. And so you can see that I'm using that, and that's kind of, we have our friendly banter between our nations, but some nations hate each other. And um, when we're united in Jesus Christ, it overrules these differences. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So now we're going to transition from talking about how we operate as Christians in our earthly nations to how we, what does Jesus say about this kingdom of God? What is this kingdom? Who's the boss of it? How does it operate? What are the parameters of it? What is this kingdom like? When did it begin? When's it going to end? In Bible prophecy, we see that it's prophesied that this kingdom is going to begin. In Daniel 2.44, it says, In the time of those kings and this is referring to a big statue, there it is there, um, and each component of this statue represents a different kingdom, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then the feet of iron and clay. And in the time of these feet of iron and clay, a giant rock is going to come, cut not by human hands, and it's going to smash down the big statue, and that rock will turn into a mountain and fill the whole earth. Now the rock represents another kingdom, and um, this kingdom will endure, the Bible says. It's going to last forever. And this kingdom is a spiritual kingdom that will fill the whole earth and last forever. John the Baptist um, preached that at his time, in his lifespan, this kingdom had come. He says in Matthew chapter 3, um, Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And Jesus said, I'm here to proclaim the good news of the kingdom to those in other towns because that's why I'm sent. And so Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is among you. And then Jesus sent out his disciples in Matthew 10 verse 7 and says, go and proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so we get this picture in the Bible that Jesus taught that there's both a present and a future element to the kingdom. That even in the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God had begun then. But it's, and it's also going to, come in a, in a more complete sense at the second coming of Jesus, where that kingdom will completely... There won't be any other kingdoms. It'll be the only one left. And it, it's going to fill the whole universe. And all the negative elements of life on earth as we know it will be ended because God's kingdom in its fullness is a place where there's no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death, no more separation... That's the old order of things from the other kingdoms, but Jesus' kingdom is going to stand and last forever. And it's going to be that place that our hearts are always longing for because we were created to exist in a kingdom like that. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, it was a, it was a place like that before sin entered into the Garden of Eden. And God is going to reinstate that kingdom. And I believe it will be even better than the Garden of Eden scenario. The Bible says that God himself is going to move the capital city of heaven to earth and he's going to dwell among us and we'll be that close to God. It's going to be a wonderful time. Many of Jesus' parables were to help people to learn what the kingdom of God was all about. And we're going to look at five or six parables really quickly right now and say, what do these things teach us about the kingdom of God? The first one that we'll look at and so in Mark 4, he says, well, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? What parable will we use to describe it? Here's a whole bunch of parables Jesus used to describe it. The first one is the parable of the sower. You remember this? Jesus says the sower comes along and he's throwing seeds and they fall on four types of soil or four types of ground. First of all, the path, and then the stony ground, then soil with thorns growing in it, and then good soil. And the path, the seeds get picked up by birds. The stony ground, the seeds put down a shallow root and then die quickly. The thorny ground, the seeds grow up but they get choked out. The plants get choked out by the thorns, like my vegetable garden, because I'm so useless at doing weeding. And then, and then the fourth one is the good soil, where the harvest is able to grow up and it produces heaps of 
produce, fruit, grain, whatever. All right, so what does it all mean? Well, because this is what the kingdom of God is like. And so God is teaching us that there's different outcomes happening here on the kingdom of earth right now. That when some people hear about the kingdom, Satan comes and snatches it away before it can even get started. The second type, and that's like the bird coming and taking the seed. The second type that died quickly are those who get the good news about the kingdom, but because of hardships or persecution, they throw in the towel straight away on their faith. The first challenge that comes up to their belief, and they quit. And, you know, sadly, I've seen people come and go from church life. They are all on fire, like a firework that goes off. Bam, I'm so excited about Jesus. And then the light goes out five seconds later because the first difficulty that came along, they gave up. Then the next one is those who hang in there longer um, but have weeds growing up around them. What were the weeds that threaten somebody's membership in the kingdom of God? These weeds were the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. So this, this is a challenge to people who are regular churchgoers. You know, Satan's missed his chance to snatch away the seed. He hasn't been able to scare us off with a calamity or a real big pressure that came in our life. We're hanging in there, so his long-term way of trying to discourage and stifle out our connection to God's kingdom is by filling our life with worries, busyness, and an obsession with money. Does any of that sound ring true? Yeah, this is uh, the world that we live in, isn't it? Has there ever been a time where the world seems so fast-paced, filled with worries, and that money seems such a necessity? Um, so this is Satan's strategy. We just don't have time for God. He gets shoved back down the line, out of first position. And then the final one is this soil that's good soil, that hears and understands and bears fruit. So my question to you, and I think that Jesus' question to you is, what kind of a soil do you want to be? Do you want to be a soil that gives up at the first sign of trouble? Do you want to be a soil that allows those weeds to grow up in your life, busyness, obsession with money? Or do you want to do some gardening like I need to do in my garden and get rid of those things and pluck stuff out of your life so you've got time and space for God to be first place? And so the kingdom of God is going to take some decisions on your own part about what position you're going to put for God in your life. Are you going to have a soft heart when the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart and understand God's word? Or are you going to allow your heart to become hardened as you focus on other worries and, and other important things? And Jesus is calling you, have a soft heart. When you hear my spirit come knocking, listen to what it's saying. Give in to me. That's going to be the soil that produces a whole harvest in your life. The parable of the sower makes us ask ourselves, what kind of soil are we? Will we produce a harvest for God's kingdom? The next parable that we're going to look at is, goes like this. Jesus told them another parable, Matthew 13, 24, 25. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. I think that's what happened to my vegetable garden, actually. Um, and so this is another sort of farming parable. And Jesus used stories like this because everyone's familiar with it and you can get the idea. What a pain in the neck to come out and you notice that among your wheat crop all this other rubbish is growing up. What's the message of the kingdom? Well, the parable of the enemy sower teaches and recognises that good and bad people in the world will be recognised ultimately by their fruit. And even inside of a church, we'll have people who aren't sincere in their faith and those who are sincere in our faith. And we can't go ripping people out prematurely because we don't have any idea early in the day how people, are going to, how people are going to turn out. But ultimately, at the end of our lives, as we look back, we'll be able to see from the kind of fruit that we had in our lives, did our hearts really show, reflect that we're a part of God's kingdom or not? It'll be obvious as we look back. Here's another parable about the kingdom, Matthew 13, 31 and 33. Then he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, a tiny little seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And then he told another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And a woman took this yeast, small amount, and kneaded it into about 60 pounds of flour, and, and it worked all through the dough. And we see these parables repeated elsewhere. 
that the mustard seed grows up to be the biggest plant in the whole garden. And the yeast that was a small component permeates through the whole bread and when you put it in the oven, makes the whole bread rise up and has an influence on the whole thing. So what do we learn? Well, these parables, the one of the mustard seed and the yeast, reveal that God might seem, his kingdom may seem small to start off with, but eventually it becomes the greatest kingdom of all and it's going to impact everything. This is true on a personal level as well as on a universal level. When you invite Jesus into your heart, it might seem like a small thing at first, but believe me, he's got big plans for you and he's going to change everything. And don't be afraid because that's the best future for any one of us that we could have. And so second of all, Christianity seemed like such a little backwater movement when it started off with. These fishermen, uneducated people became the leaders of it and you know, you could imagine the thing would just get snuffed out. But now there's two billion Christians on planet Earth. It's the biggest religion in the world. And the Bible says that it's ultimately God's kingdom's going to be the only kingdom left standing. It's going to fill the whole world. Matthew um, 13, 45 and 46 says another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven's like a merchant like a person who buys and sells, looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had to buy this one pearl. Interesting. Sold everything he had to buy this one pearl. The parable of the merchant and, then, and of the field teach us that the kingdom of God is valuable and it requires sacrifice to obtain it. God says you've got to be willing to set everything aside to put Jesus first. Wow. A couple more. Matthew 13, 47 to 48 says, Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Who here is a fisherman or a fisherwoman? Getting any, any people into fishing here? So he's saying you throw out a huge net and you scoop it in and when you pull it out, it's not just all flounder or it's not all trout or it's not all the same thing. You've got a whole menagerie of fish. <clears throat> And when it's pulled up on the shore, the fishermen pull it up on the shore and they sat down and they put the good fish in one basket and they chuck the bad fish away. Now this, this parable introduces the theme of judgment. And the Bible says that there's going to be a judgment and we'll look at that topic in some of the sessions coming up. And many are attracted to God's kingdom, but not everyone's going to meet the criteria to obtain it. And there's going to be a sorting of people. And that... Um, can make us feel afraid. But if we turn towards Jesus, there's nothing to, to be afraid of. Matthew 13, 52 says, Therefore, every teacher of the law has become a disciple. Uh, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well of, as of old. Now, at my place, we don't have a room filled with treasures. We've got a room filled with junk. I don't know about you. Do you all have a junk room at your house? And it's the, maybe it's the garage or the shed out the back. And if you go sifting through there, maybe I would think that they're treasures, but nobody else in the world would think they are. And they'd say, why don't you get rid of this stuff? But um, Jesus is saying, imagine someone who's pulling out of their house these treasures, new treasures and old treasures. And what is this? He's saying this is like someone who's teaching God's law. They're going to discover new treasures um, and the, here it is. The parable of the new and old treasures teaches that God's word is full of new and old truths that will richly bless those who accept them. And as we get into God's word, as it's taught, we're going to discover that our lives get blessed with these treasures. Who is, first of all, just amazed to see that what a lineup of parables there are that say the kingdom of heaven is like? Is that new for anybody? There's so many teachings in the Bible about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And I think that it's handy. I, don't, I know it doesn't work exactly like this. But to imagine an old-fashioned kingdom with a castle in the middle and the village all around. And God is the king of that kingdom on the throne. And he says, do you want to be a part of my kingdom? And in a moment, we're going to have a look at this. But how do you be a part of God's kingdom? And what do you have to do to be one of the subjects in this kingdom? And what is it like to belong to that kingdom? We, we've seen a bit of how important it is to be a part of that kingdom. But the Bible also teaches that there's another kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And the Bible teaches that Satan is real and that 
Um, without God, we belong to the kingdom of darkness. Now, some of it might say, that's a bit heavy. I'm, you know, I'm not worshipping Satan. I don't even, some might say, oh, I don't even believe in him. But the Bible teaches that without God, there's only darkness. And that while um, you know, I believe that people, um, many people who don't know God still do good things, but I believe that that's because God is actually at work in their life, even though they don't know his name. And so um, there's a battle going on between these two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Ephesians 6.13 says, Our fight, our struggle in life, is not against flesh and blood, not against the things that we can see around us, but it's ultimately against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And Satan's goal, John chapter 10 tells us, is that he's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what staying in his kingdom is going to end up with. And, um, but Colossians 1.13 says about Jesus that Jesus is all about getting us out of the darkness, smashing those chains that hold us back, chains of addiction, chains of depression, chains of selfishness, things that are really, we would just be better off without. And he says he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. If that sounds good, say yes. That's what God wants for us. And in Acts chapter 26, 17 and 18, it's recorded how Jesus sends out his disciples to go and share the good news of this kingdom. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes. Now, we're all Gentiles, anyone who's not a Jew. So the whole world gets this message, that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Isn't that awesome? So here's the question. How does a person become part of the kingdom of God? If that's a good question, say yes. I think that's worth looking at. How do we answer it? It's not a hard thing, you know. <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus tells us. He says, The time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. So repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repenting and believing. And um, we were just doing a Bible study about it this week. And so this is the very heart of the gospel message. It's kind of what William talked about last night. What do we need to do to connect with Jesus? We need to repent and believe. That's our entrance into the kingdom of God. If he's the king, and how do we become one of his subjects? Um, let me tell you about his kingdom. His kingdom is not a kingdom run by an evil dictator who's all about the peasants going and working hard and him creaming off the best of it and only giving the scraps for them to live on. No, this is a king who, when there's a battle to go into, he gets off of his throne, he rolls up his sleeves, and he leads his followers into battle. And if there's bullets flying, he'll take the worst of the bullets himself and in protecting his followers. Would you like a king like that? That's our King Jesus. That's what he's like. Here's a king who, when you break the rules and mess things up, he doesn't go and throw you in the clink and throw away the key. He, he comes and appeals to you and says, how'd you like it if I paid the penalty for you and we'll get you out of this mess? And he sends, in his, he sends his, his squad of Navy SEALs to rescue people from the darkest dungeons of addiction. He sends his, his squadron of elite troops to, to rescue people out of selfishness out of obsession with things that are going to take them down the wrong path and and who are these helpers well one of them is himself he sends himself the holy spirit goes he's got angels on his side but he also recruits other people and that's us other subjects to help in this work of rescuing and helping one another in this kingdom where jesus is the king he doesn't say if you want to visit me you know, make an application and um, every five years we'll have five visitors from each province be allowed into the throne room. That's not how it operates. He says, how about this? I'm going to give you a mobile phone. You need me anytime, anywhere. You just ring this number. I'm going to be listening. I'm ready there for you right away. That's, what's that phone called, friends? That's called prayer. And that's what kind of a king we have. You've got access to him any time of the day or night. You're worried about something? Ask him for help. You need some help and extra strength, you ask him straight away. He's listening. And we've got a king who is so unselfish 
that he's willing to share his authority. And he says, I'm not going to just call you my subjects, which I could, but I'm going to call you my own children. How's that sound? Every single person in God's kingdom, he says, you're not my subjects. He says, you're my own children. You're my own children. And he says, you know what that means? I'm going to share my authority with you. And he says, I'm going to make some room on my throne for you and share all the blessings that that... Now, when I say that, that's almost overwhelming. And a few things jump to mind. Is God saying that we become gods too? No, that's not what he's saying at all. We can't become gods. It's impossible. We're created beings. But what he is saying is he's going to share his power with us, his authority. And so God, as I said at the beginning, has a purpose and a plan for every single one of us. And as soon as we make a decision in our lives to line up our lives with him, more of his power flows through our lives to accomplish great things that we need kingly authority and power to accomplish. But you only discover this as you seek after God and you align your life with the king. So how do we do it? Well, we repent and believe. So what does it mean? And this is our final thoughts. What does it mean to repent and believe? Well, first of all, repenting means turning from self-centeredness and surrendering to God as king. What does that mean? It means putting God's kingdom first. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, and everything else will be given to you as well, all your needs. Repenting means putting God first over my own will and desires, over my ambitions, over my popularity, everything. And sometimes we have to make tough choices to choose between putting God first and something else. <clears throat> and when we come to God... We, always, we all have big dreams. Some of us, our dreams are bigger than others. Some of us, our big dream is to just get home tonight and watch the football, and our dreams don't go any further than that. Others of us have big dreams to maybe change the world or earn a million dollars or have a big family. Whether the dream is good or bad, God is saying, I want you to lay it down and be willing to put me first. What happens is once you've laid down your dream, whether it's good or bad, and you put God first, if it's a good God-given dream, if it's the best dream for your life, he'll let you pick it up again. And in fact, he'll help you pick it up and help you achieve it. But if it's a trashy dream that was really going to just drive you to the grave, um, breaking your own heart and breaking the hearts of those around you, or missing out on the great destiny that God had planned for you, he's going to say, guess what, I've got a better plan for you. And you're going to realize, hey, I didn't need that anyway. And because your hands are empty, you're no longer clutching on to this something that's second rate. They are ready to receive something that's first rate. And so God says, surrender your wills and desires, surrender your ambitions, and then let me lift you up. Surrender your popularity. And sometimes when you choose to feel Je follow Jesus, it's sad to say, but some of your friends will reject you. And this is the truth. They won't like it. It'll make them feel uncomfortable or whatever. And you're not rejecting them, but they'll reject you. And Jesus says, I want you to follow me anyway. Now, here's the great news. The Bible says if you lose anything following Jesus in his kingdom, he's going to give you back a hundred times as much in this life. You lose a friend, he's got a hundred new friends waiting for you. And I'm not saying the old one doesn't matter, but I'm saying if that person is not going to love you just because you're following Jesus, they're not the great friend we once thought they were anyway. And I'm not saying that that's not sad. It's still sad. But let's be honest about where their, where their heart's at. And it, I mean, it can be even worse when it's um, a family member or someone that you really revere. But Jesus is saying, I'm calling you to nothing less than put me first, even over your popularity and your relationships. He's calling us to put him first over everything. Here's another way of saying that. Imagine that this house is your life and you invite Jesus into the front door of your life saying, yes, Jesus, come into my heart. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And Jesus says, great. I'm so glad you've made me the king over your life. And he comes in and he's dressed like an EQC repair person. He's got his paintbrush in one hand and his angle grinder in the other hand. And he says, well, let's start here in the foyer. We're going to rip up the carpet. I've got some nice new carpet for you. And you say, thanks, that was disgusting anyway. It's good to see that go. And one part at a time, Jesus is, becomes the king over all of your life. And as he goes through, these transformations take place in your lifestyle, in your marriage and family, in your recreation. But what happens from time to time is we rejoice as he goes through and revamps and trans transforms all these different parts of our life. But then he gets to a particular part that we might be a bit precious about, 
that we're not ready to let go of, that we don't really want Jesus to be king over. And maybe he comes around here and he gets to your career and you had a very ambitious plan that meant that you're working seven days a week and you know that this conflicts with God's Sabbath commandment, let's say, and, um, and you don't want to let it go. You think, just three more years and I'll have achieved what I need to achieve and then I'll follow you, Jesus. But he keeps on knocking on the door of that room saying, I really want to get in there. I really want to vamp it up. I want you to allow me to be king over that part of your life as well. Or maybe for some of us, it's our diet and health. And we, we love everything about God, but we really just don't want to give up something that's unhealthy for us. Maybe it's the alcohol, or maybe it's something that's ruining our lives, or maybe it's not a bad thing, but it's too much of a good thing, and our arteries are getting clogged up, and we're not looking after our bodies the way that Jesus wants us to. And so he wants to transform all of our lives, our friendships, our finances, our sexuality, our education. And each one of these things is an opportunity to see God become king in a greater way. But each one is also an opportunity for the devil to get in there and say, don't trust Jesus with that. Because at the end of the day, this all boils down to trust. Everybody say trust. This is the real issue. Do I trust that if I follow Jesus and make him king over my finances, that I'm going to turn out, that things are going to turn out for the best? Do I trust that if I follow him with my family, that things will turn out for the best? Do I trust him or do I trust myself or someone else more? And Jesus is calling us to trust him with the whole package, the whole package. That's what it means to repent, to turn away from running life yourself and to turn towards Jesus and put him in charge of the whole package. Friends, I hope that you're choosing to repent today. And it's something to do each day, to come back to God and say, God, I put you in charge of the whole package today. Let's have a great day together. I want to move forward with your blessing. The next part is believing. This is so easy. It means accepting Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as payment for my sins and receiving God's salvation and forgiveness as a free gift. And Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 10 says that that our, our salvation is the free gift of God. It's faith given by him so that no one can boast. And so God is saying, you're going to get to heaven because I've paid the price for you and given it to you as a free gift. So these are the two things that it means to be a, become a part of God's kingdom, to make him the king over my life and to say, I want to, I want to receive you as my saviour. And that's why we say this simple prayer, Lord Jesus, be my saviour and be my Lord. The saviour is about believing in him for salvation and be my Lord is about repenting from living life my own way and making him the king of my life. Does that make sense? Repenting and believing, making him saviour and Lord. This is what the heart of a connection with Jesus is all about. It's all about putting him first and trusting him and leaning on him to provide and to be our saviour and God. God is the ultimate king, loving and powerful, most worthy of our worship and service and love. And Romans 8.17 says this, Since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. What an awesome king. And so right now we're going to um, have a card handed out. And Pam, I wonder if you could help. But on that chair right there at the front, there's cards and pens. And I wonder if everybody could grab one. Maybe someone else could help Pam get them out quickly. And I want to go through this card with you. And if you're watching or listening on the DVD or CD as I read it out, I want to encourage you to be a part of this as well. And this is a great time to respond to Jesus and say, yes, God, I can think of no better time to become a part of your kingdom. Can I have one, Pam? Thanks. Beautiful. All right, let's just go through this together. My decision, it says there. If this is for you, just... Tick this. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart, just mark the box there. It says, Jesus, I want to be part of your kingdom. If that's you, you want to be a part of his kingdom, tick that box. Maybe you've given your heart to Jesus a thousand times before. There's nothing as good as reconnecting with him throughout the day. So you've done it before, you can do it again. Yes, God, I want to be a part of your kingdom. If it's the first time or you've strayed from him for a while, come back to Jesus. He's calling you, friend. He's saying, child, come on home. Come on home. Say, yes, God, I want to be part of your kingdom. And the next one, Jesus, I accept you as sovereign reign or king in all areas of my life. 
I want you to be the boss of every area. Maybe as you looked at that picture of the house up on the screen, you, a few little rooms sort of set off a bell and you thought, well, I struggle with surrendering this or that to God. And you want to just say right now to God, God, I'm willing to make you the boss of the whole lot. Just check that box. And the next one down, Jesus, I believe your promise that you're coming again. And um, the Bible talks about a time when the kingdom is going to be fulfilled altogether. And if you believe that Jesus is coming again, you check that box. And finally, Jesus, I commit myself to serving you and extending your kingdom. You want to be one of his Navy SEALs that's helping spread his love with others? You check that box there. And he's going to use you and unleash his purpose and plan in your life. Then on the back, if you've got some feedback or anything you'd like, you can mark that out. Friends, if you're watching online or um, watching a DVD, just get in contact with us through an email or through the website or through the friend who gave you the DVD, and we would love to help you on your journey. Right now, let's pray together and ask God to bless us as we move forward being a part of his kingdom. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thanks that the offer of being a citizen in your kingdom is available to everybody. It's not like some nations where you have to jump through hoops or they may never let you in. You're calling everyone, but not everyone will be in your kingdom because we don't all meet the criteria. And we've got to choose to make you the king of all our lives, not just most of it, but the whole deal. And we've got to choose to receive your free gift of salvation. So Lord, help us to make that choice today. And I just want to pray along with everyone. And I invite you to just pray these words with me, whether you're watching at home or somewhere else or here in the room today. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Come into my heart. I want to join your kingdom. Please forgive my sins. Please be my saviour. And please be the king of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow you. Thank you for making me your child and a part of your kingdom. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You know, if you just prayed that simple prayer, I believe that you've just been born again. You've been saved or you've just recommitted your heart to Jesus Christ. And now my prayer for you is to continue that journey. And so what a better time to um, mention our little journals, um, this terrific, beautiful little resource. Has everybody got one now? If you don't have one, we've got a pile up the front here. And if you're watching somewhere and you don't have one, send us a message. We'll love to try and get you one. And this journal is just one of many ways, but I really encourage you to give it a try. It's a 30-day journey with God. By spending time with Him, you'll find your faith strengthened and your experience with God grow and grow and grow. So grab a hold of that. And just a reminder, on Monday night, we've got a really terrific topic. It's probably um, one of my favorite topics to teach on altogether. And the topic... Um, is what Jesus says about work-life balance. So please join us for that. And then on Friday night, we've got William. Saturday, we're back again. And then we'll be halfway through our series. Thanks for joining us, everyone. God bless. And have a great day.